Um, so I am a, a professor of clinical psychology here at the New School for Social Research. For the last uh, 30 years, uh, really have been researching um, under the rubric of intergenerational patterns of attachment. So looking at the way in which one's own experience of childhood influences the way you parent the next generation. And uh, for 18 years, I was in London, England. I trained as a child psychoanalyst at the Anna Freud Center. Um, and uh, my PhD work was looking at the intergenerational patterns of attachment. And I'll be talking a little bit about that study, including showing you some video from um, that work that we collected um, now more than 30 years ago. Um, we were lucky at the time yeah. that uh, our supervisor, Peter mm -hmm. Clonaghy, suggested mm -hmm. that we be in touch with. Um, Miriam, we're going to need a little bit, we're going to need your voice to be a little bit stronger. Stronger? Okay. Yeah, I don't quite hear. That's a little closer. Okay, I'll get Thanks. closer. Um, yeah. So, our PhD supervisor at the time, uh, Peter Fonaghy, uh, said he didn't know anything about attachment theory um, and that we should go talk to John Bowlby, who was at the Tavistock Clinic. And so, as uh, a couple of very young Canadians, we went and John Bowlby um, actually supported our research in terms of supervision and consultation. Somewhere along the way, I gave a talk uh, to a group um, about those intergenerational patterns. And in the audience was a social worker, Jean Kanyuk, who was from Quorum Family, who specialized in um, adoptive placements for hard to place children. So these are children who suffered from maltreatment, who then at the age between four and eight years old were um, being placed with permanent adoptive families. And she said, wouldn't um, some of the measures that you've used in your longitudinal study be very helpful to social workers as a way of understanding how to make the matches between adoptive or even foster parents and their children. And so I'll be talking to you today about that study. Um, I thought uh, when I saw that the, one of the main interests amongst many of you are in the realm of child maltreatment, uh, that we often um, have so much work geared towards the very young zero to three age range and not so much um, with many of the children that we're dealing with that are a little bit older. Um, and so I thought that uh, this would be a good topic for us today. So I will um, begin sharing my slides. We talked with Paula that if any of you have questions, you can put them up in the chat. If they're about what I'm talking about right at that moment, I'm happy to stop and answer the question. If they're kind of more global or overall questions, then we can take those um, at the end. So as I said, we were very fortunate um, to have had the expertise and consultation of John Bowlby. And so for that reason, and because- um, TikTok. Wait a second. We need to have people put their, their, their um, uh, sound on mute, please. We're hearing people. Thank you. Okay. 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 So um, I wouldn't be giving this talk if it weren't for the strong theoretical background of attachment theory that was put forward by John Bowlby and then um, co-created really with Mary Ainsworth. So I like to start every talk with some words of John Bowlby. And this quote especially feels like it's very pertinent to the work that we might do uh, with children um, who are in the foster care and adoption um, context. So he says, it seems necessary to postulate that whatever representational models of attachment figures and of self an individual builds during his childhood and adolescence, these tend to persist relatively unchanged into and throughout adult life. As a result, he tends to assimilate any new person with whom he may form a bond to an existing model and often continue to do so despite repeat evidence that the model is inappropriate. Similarly, he expects to be perceived and treated by them in ways that would be appropriate to his self models and to continue with such expectations despite contrary evidence. So the reason that I think this is so pertinent to our work is that um, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at how can these representational models of attachment change when we do something um, revolutionary, so um, dramatic as allowing the child to have permanent caregivers that are very different from the maltreating environments that they were in. And what do we do in those situations where the children seem to expect these new caregivers to behave much like um, their experiences in the past? And so it's really about the making and breaking of 
those kinds of models so that new, um, more benign models can exist within the child. So um, what will an attachment theory uh, or research bring to the work with, um, that we do with child maltreatment? Well, for the start, um, it is a model of affect regulation. In some ways we could uh, find and replace everywhere that we say attachment and really see it as somewhere a model that is uh, telling us about how an individual is able to regulate their feeling states um, and keep them within an appropriate range, but extend them at the same time so that um, they're not kind of defended against and come to a very narrow um, spectrum of feeling states. There's a broad base of evidence-based knowledge now to do with parents and children within the attachment um, literature. And as we move so much towards evidence-based practice, that's very helpful for us. It also gives us a, a window upon the inner world, right? So we're not just looking at behaviors on the outside, we're really trying to dig a little deeper and seeing what are those models that help us understand what's going on um, within the inner world. And it's this move to the level of representation I'll be talking about in terms of um, are now using the adult attachment interview. I'll make reference to something called the parent development interview that is really looking to um, surprise the unconscious, ask people questions um, in a way that they've not used to being asked that reveals for us a little bit about what is the set of templates that help understand how they're thinking about relationships. Miriam, we need a little bit more volume. More Sorry. volume still. A little bit more volume, yeah. Good. Okay. We also have within the attachment framework um, ideas and influences around the resolution of trauma and loss. And one can easily imagine why those are so um, important in terms of child maltreatment. Um, and then I think as well that one uh, would have to remember that the attachment framework really has a high regard and respect for both the parents and children um, inherent in it. Okay, so the first measure I'm gonna to talk to us about here is Mary Ainsworth's um, strain situation. Um, and the reason that we're gonna pay some attention to this is because all of the measures um, that we use within an attachment framework in some ways are um, going back to some of Mary Ainsworth's um, ideas when she came up with this 20 minute paradigm, a way of asking what is the nature of the child's attachment to each parent. It tries to do two things at once. One is activate the attachment system via separation. Separation was really um, highlighted by John Bowlby as if you wanna see the attachment system at work, you have to um, provoke it to some extent. And the best way we do that um, is through separation. Very interesting for us all now as we are all um, separated still with this COVID virus situation. The other thing that the strain situation is trying to do is it's trying to activate the exploration system. And these two are in tandem with one another. When your attachment system is provoked, when you're very preoccupied with where your relationships are, it's very hard to explore your environment. We see this a lot with children in the foster care and adoption context where we know that their attachment systems are so dysregulated, it makes it hard for them to learn. Um, and so we're, we're looking at those two dimensions. On the other side, what we're most interested in is the child's strategy upon reunion. Um, so we sometimes hear from social workers, oh, I think this child is very attached to, to the parent um, because they cried when the parent left. That's important information for us, but what's more important is how did the child respond when the parent uh, was reunited? Um, we want to be looking at attachment in the presence of the caregiver. So reunion is, is really very important. Across the globe, we get these um, three main ways of responding to the separations and reunions that are um, part of the strain situation, where 65% of children um, display patterns which we call secure. These are children who usually are somewhat upset um, by the separation, but more importantly, when the parent returns, they seek the parent as a way of soothing and uh, gaining some protection and coming back to some kind of homeostasis. 20% of the population around the world um, get classified as avoidant. These are children who seem less bothered by the separation. And when the parent returns, uh, do things like crawl to the other side of the room to play with a toy as if it really didn't um, matter to them at all. We know though physiologically that their cortisol levels rise, that they are very um, much dysregulated by the uh, separation. 
but I've already learned, you know what, when I'm distressed, my parent isn't there for me. I better manage this on my own. And so already by nine months, 10 months, 12 months of age, they have a defensive response. I will keep this to myself. About 10% of the population get classified. These are children who uh, uh, very much feel the distress of the separation. And yet when the parent comes back, they can't really use the parent for emotional refueling. So they'll do things like um, motion to be picked up by the parent. As soon as they're picked up, they ask to be put down. As soon as they're put down, they wanna be picked up again. It looks quite chaotic, but they do have a strategy in mind. These three patterns altogether, we consider to be organized strategies as compared to the disorganized strategy, which is a fourth um, classification that was really articulated by Mary Main, who was a study of Mary, uh, a student of Mary Ainsworth, who found that some children simply did not fit into one of those three organized patterns. In our typical populations, that's about five or 10% of the children that we assess in the strain situation. But in terms of children who've suffered from maltreatment, it's more like 80 to 90% of the children. So they're the group that we're most worried about. Their prognosis is, um, the worst in terms of later displays of externalizing behavior problems, internalizing behavior problems, and um, in terms of future outcomes, um, they have a, a bigger likelihood of psychopathology, including borderline personality disorder and antisocial um, personality disorder. So those disorganized children are the ones that um, we're most interested in looking at in terms of the clinical ramifications. So the seesaw here is here to describe the separation, the attachment system, and then the exploration um, system that we get in this um, scenario where we have a playroom, supposed to look like a waiting room, the parent is introduced, um, lots of toys for the baby to play with. The parent is given instructions, which is do not initiate an interaction with your child, but respond as you usually uh, would at home. So um, I think what I'm gonna do here is escape this and we're gonna go, um, Tal, we're gonna show some video. And, um, ask for your reactions, but we're very short of time, nor can I see you. So we're gonna um, talk just for a second about this. I hope what you picked up was um, the exploration that this little boy did uh, in the presence of his mother. He was quite interested in the toys. He was a little bit wary of that stranger, um, stayed quite close to his mother at that point, but was still smiling with her. When his mother left, you could see that seesaw. You could see that he was still interested a little bit in exploring, but once his mother um, looked like she was leaving, he was almost clearing the landmines and, and getting to the door so that uh, he could get close to her again. And then how quickly he um, got back to kind of some homeostasis and refueled himself once she came back in the room. So he displays the kind of prototypical secure attachment um, pattern um, with high proximity seeking of his mother, he maintained contact. I don't know if some of you noticed he was hanging onto her pant leg as if to say, nope, um, I'm gonna hold on to you so you don't uh, get up and go again. I'm now gonna show um, a different example. Um, so if we're gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go back to our slides here. Um, Okay, so in that second uh, case, we saw um, a child who was displaying disorganized attachment. We're looking at that in terms of his behavior. The only thing that happened to upset this child was someone that he didn't know walked into the room. His mother was still there. There was nothing stopping um, him from turning around and seeking some kind of consolation um, from her. Instead, the only strategy that he seems act to have access to is to fall asleep. We don't think he fell asleep because he was tired. We think he was so overwhelmed that in that moment, that felt like the best strategy for him um, to manage the painful context of, of being so uh, dysregulated um, and fearful of a stranger coming into the room. So it's one of the um, aspects of disorganized attachment. We see stilling behavior. We see other odd behaviors. For example, a child trying to leave the room as the parent um, is coming into the room. Again, we're looking at this from an evolutionary perspective that the strain situation is um, 
a situation where the child is not able to survive on their own. And so we're looking for what are the strategies that they have to manage um, this uh, situation. They don't know that these crazy researchers are gonna send the parent back within uh, three minutes um, or less if they are um, upset. So we're looking at these tied to those representational models that I mentioned in the beginning um, that we think we can see in the behavior of the infant. Mary Main gave us the gift of disorganized attachment. The other gift she gave us was the adult attachment interview. She was the first one to really ask what is going on in the mind of the parent that gives rise to these different attachment patterns. I only have a few minutes to talk to you about this, but this has um, really been the huge bonus for us in terms of our clinical work to think about how we can measure something as complex as a person's representational world or their states of mind to do with attachment that is the best way for us to predict qualities of parenting of the next generation. So it tries to do what that strain situation does for the infants, but now surprising the unconscious for the adult by asking a series of questions about childhood experiences. Comes kind of in two halves. The first half is around what probably happened to the individual in their childhood. So there's questions like give me five adjectives that describe your early relationship with your mother from as early on as you can remember. And then you ask the individual for some memories or incidents. We ask about when you're upset as a child, what would you do? We ask them to talk to us about physical hurts, separation, about abuse and loss. And the second part of the interview is really, what did the person make of these experiences? And there are two questions in particular that highlight for us the demand to reflect on those experiences. And it was in answer to these two questions that we came upon the concept of reflective functioning. Can the individual put themselves in their parents' shoes and think about the thoughts, feelings, and actions that motivated their parents to behave the way they did. So the first question, and you can ask it of yourselves um, and think of your responses. Why do you think your parents behaved as they did during your childhood? And the second question is, has your childhood influenced in any way the kind of person you are today? So these two are considered the demand of reflective functioning um, questions. Here we see the way in which these intergenerational patterns come together where we have on the one side, the babies uh, classifications, avoidance, secure, resistant, and disorganized. And on the other side of our screen, we have the adult attachment interview corollaries, those that correlate with the baby patterns or predict them. So just like the baby who was very avoidant, seemed not to care that their parent was um, in the room or not, a dismissing individual, those who say, oh, my childhood happened a long time ago, um, not very much to do with um, how things are right now, or very idealizing. Oh, my one, my mother was wonderful. When asked, when upset as a child, doesn't have a lot of memory to back that up. Contrasted with the babies who are securely attached, 75% of them will have parents who are also securely attached on the adult attachment interview. Um, those are individuals that we call autonomous. They're balanced in valuing of attachment relationships. It's not that they didn't have difficult or even traumatic things happen to them in their childhood, but somewhere along the way, they've processed them, they've metabolized them, they've come to understand them. Um, and so even if negative things have happened, they have a way of talking about them. The resistant babies tend to have parents who are preoccupied or entangled with aspects of their childhood experiences, and they maximize um, their affect. So when you ask them how um, about how, about aspects that happened a long time ago, they bring it up as if it was um, yesterday and show a lot of anger or a kind of passivity um, and not really being able to seize upon the question and answer it fully. The disorganized babies tend to be uh, correlated or have parents who suffered some kind of loss or trauma that they didn't resolve. So again, it's not that they suffered uh, those traumas, but that they weren't along the way able to resolve them. And so they continue to influence the way in which that adult parents the next generation. So in terms of our findings, we did, uh, we took a hundred mothers and a hundred fathers who were pregnant. The mothers were pregnant with their first babies. Um, and we did the adult attachment interview in the last trimester of a first pregnancy. 
And then we brought them back and we did the strain situation with the babies and their mothers at 12 months and with the babies and their fathers at 18 months. And we were able to replicate Mary Main's findings and the findings of the Grossman's and other longitudinal studies to show that asking the adult attachment interview questions even before the baby is born allowed us to predict with 75% accuracy the quality of the baby's responses uh, to the parent in the strain situation. We did not find um, a connection in terms of if a baby was secure with mother, that didn't uh, let us know anything about whether they would be secure with father. These were independent. So uh, one of the calls uh, or take home messages for today is, is our wish to really involve fathers in our um, understandings about attachment, but as well in terms of possibilities for foster care and adoptive placements where perhaps we're not so um, convinced that the mothers might be uh, securely attached, but might be a father on the scene who can um, help us understand and, and parent the next generation. So we have these two um, links between talking about your own childhood history in one person and the behavior in their infants with another. As we read through the 200 um, interviews, we noticed that for some of them who, saved, who, who suffer from past adversity, there was uh, some unique feature. There was this almost um, very striking ability to talk about those experiences. So we um, pulled out from our sample those that uh, suffered from past deprivation. They had some of these um, features, long separation from parents before age 11, being part of a single parent family, low socioeconomic status, fathers being unemployed for longer than three months, severe illness in mother and father, and boarding school experience before age 11. I think this came about because we were a couple of Canadians and shocked by how many of these British families had been sent to boarding school very early on. So this, um, this slide, don't, don't get too scared, we're gonna go through it um, together. It's a construct of reflective functioning that um, influenced whether the babies would be securely or insecurely attached. On one side, we have all of the um, adults who are in that non-deprived group. That is, they didn't have those features of deprivation. If they had a high reflective functioning, you see a lot of green, the color of security, the, most of them had um, babies who are securely attached. If they weren't deprived, but had low reflective functioning, it was about 50-50 whether their babies would be securely attached to them. The next set of bars are actually much more interesting for us. These are individuals who faced adversity. You can think of them as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, but some of them had this capacity to reflect on those experiences. If they had that capacity, if they had suffered deprivation but could talk about those experiences, every single one of them had a baby that was securely attached. As compared to those that faced high adversity, but didn't have this capacity of reflective functioning, every single one of them had a baby that was insecurely attached. You see that blue bar there, um, very high. So we learned something really important about what we can maybe promote clinically as a way of breaking that cycle that we know exists with maltreating parents who then passed along to their children. So that was kind of the backdrop to the study that I'm gonna to talk to you about now, which is trying to put some of those measures to work within an adoption context. So it was a three-way collaboration between myself, I was at the Anna Freud Center at the time, Quorum Family that specializes in um, difficult uh, adoptive placement and Jill Hodges, who at the time was at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. There's three of us. Okay, so here's the outline of the study. What we did was we um, administered the adult attachment interview before a child was placed with one of these families with both parents, with mothers and fathers. We had 63 children who were uh, what we call late adopted. So those were between the ages of four and eight. And we had a comparison group of 43 children who were adopted within the first 12 months of their lives, but were now four through eight. So they were all had an adoption context but clearly some of them had faced much less adversity than the others. Then within about, within the first six weeks of a placement, we did something called the parent development interview. We looked at the child's cognitive and behavioral capacities. And then we looked at their internal world by using something called story stem um, approach. And I'll talk about that in a minute. 
We then brought them all back one year later and two years later. And we were then interested in the impact of now being placed in a permanent um, home, how that would change the children's um, inner world as well as their um, behavior um, capacities as well. So the first bit of good news um, that my colleague Jean Kanyuk um, likes to cite is, is how did these parents um, fare on the adult attachment interview? So uh, I have this slide in terms of typical populations. This is from a large meta-analysis that was done by Marina Swan Eisendorn and Marianne Beckerman's Cranenberg, where we see that more of the adoptive parents came up with the secure attachment classification. You'll see that that number is 68% as compared to the typical population, which is 55%. The Corn family social workers do a very uh, comprehensive set of um, home studies before these um, parents are selected to adopt one of these children. And so this was kind of confirmation that they did a good job, that the majority of the parents were securely attached. 12% of, of the adoptive parents were dismissing as compared to 20% in the general population and 20% uh, were also rated as unresolved. You'll see there's no orange there. I think the preoccupied um, individuals get um, selected out. They come across as clearly having difficulties in terms of their attachment. Um, so those weren't uh, represented in the adoptive parents, but we are concerned about especially the 20% who are unresolved and then those that were um, dismissing. So just um, something about whether uh, the attachment status that we rated independently matched in any way with the um, social workers um, understanding of who uh, these families were. So social workers um, tended to place children with parents who were classified as secure, who were um, abused at a younger age and had a higher incidence of physical abuse. And I show this just to indicate that there was perhaps some understanding that those were the adopters who could manage um, the more difficult children. Uh, so that was uh, uh, independent assessments from us and from the social workers. I don't have a lot of time to go into this. So I'll put this up here and the slides will be made available. We use something called the parent development interview. It's an interview like the adult attachment interview, but instead of assessing childhood experiences, we were assessing what was the parent's uh, representation of who this child was. And remember we did this very early on when the child was first placed one year later and two years later. Getting some kind of view of how the parent talks about the child, what was, what was the child like when they were first placed, adjective to describe the child, how does the parent see themselves as a parent, what gives them the most joy, the most pain in being a parent, um, where do they turn to for emotional support, and something around the child's adaptation to the place, placement. Uh, we know, for example, in our DSM-5 and uh, from before that uh, some of these children suffer from um, some of the reactive attachment disorder um, markers, being overly friendly, affectionate, uh, and we we're also very interested in the response to distress. As some of the parents would tell us um, vignettes like uh, the child falls um, and cuts their knee, and it's only when the parent points to the blood dribbling down that um, the child even uh, puts together that they've been hurt. So we were especially interested in that. We have a coding system that looks very much at aspects of the affect, um, and then in terms of joy, anger, dis uh, disappointment, uh, in terms of how the mother sees herself, how much confidence she has in her parenting role, how she sees the child, um, in terms of how uh, happy, angry, manipulative they are. And then we um, looked at, uh, because we're interested in reflective functioning and the coherence of the story, how those hang together just to give you a brief sound of what this is like. One of the mothers when asked, can you describe a time in the last week when you really clicked with Sam? She says, we were gardening yesterday and I found this big fat green bug in the soil and brought it over for him to see. And he really liked it. And he really likes wood lice, which I can't stand. And he said, feel it on your hand, mommy. It's all tickly. And so I let him put a wood lice on my hand, which was against my better judgment. And he really liked the fact that it was running all over me. Here, I think um, perhaps with me, you will hear this mother very much paying attention to um, her child and uh, his likes and dislikes and being available um, to him. As compared to this mother was asked, what do you like most about Tom? Tom is a little charmer. He 
You know, I mean, when people look at him, you know, they see what appears to be a happy little child. He's far from being a happy little child. He needs statementing. The previous borough got out of that. Uh, that's educational help from the city. Hopefully the borough that we're in will do that for him. But just say, you know, the worst scenario, and you know, he didn't do very well at school and that he could probably get by in, his, in life because of his charm. Once he got to the stage where he could use it to his own good, whereas at the moment he's not able to reason or anything like that, right? So these two children both play, um, and we captured these within the first, um, in, the, in this case, first three weeks of the children being there and one being very open to who her child was and being there for, for them. And this uh, mother instead showing quite a lot of hostility early on to her child. So what did we learn about the mothers whose adult attachment interviews uh, that were collected before the children were placed and how they talked to us about the children in this parent development interview in that first phase at placement? So mothers who were secure talked with more about more joy, they were more competent, they had a more child focus, they were more reflective, um, their descriptions were more vivid, and less anger and despair. One year later, and our hearts sank when we saw that they uh, were describing these children as more rejecting and more guilt, but also they did uh, convey more child focus, richness, and confidence. So something happened in that honeymoon phase that changed over the year. Um, but two years later, those parents that were securely attached on the adult attachment interview showed less guilt. So that went down. We think that has to do with some of the limit setting that they felt they needed to do within that first year. And by two years, they had worked out something uh, more because instead we see um, all of these positive features that these parents who were securely attached showed as compared to the parents whose adult attachment interviews were dismissing. So the securely attached parents now two years on have all of these positive features and it's especially coherence, right? Does their story hang together? Do they have incidents to elucidate what they're telling us? So the securely attached parents had a, had a mean of 3.4 on coherence versus those that were insecurely attached on the adult attachment interview had a score of 2.3. Um, and then those that had uh, loss or tra trauma, those that were unresolved, what they told us at placement was that they needed more emotional support, that they were more disappointed, showed more despair and hostility um, in terms of the children and less of these positive features. So in terms of our policy implications, here's one of the first ones that we know. Not that we don't want to include some of the parents who put themselves forward to do this most difficult task of um, taking one of these children in, but we know from them at placement that they're asking for more emotional support or that we need to provide more for them than perhaps for the parents who are securely attached. One of the questions that often comes up in uh, cases around um, foster care and adoption, will it help us to know the number of caregivers in a child's history in terms of um, before they were placed, um, in terms of their eventual outcome? And so we split those children up in terms of those with more caregivers before they were placed versus less. Those with more care caregivers were reported by their mothers to have higher levels of aggression, they were more controlling um, and less affectionate and more rejecting. Their mothers reported that they were more angry, they needed more support, they weren't so confident, and they weren't as warm. One year later, all of those features disappear, and those children who had more caregivers um, were associated, though, with more aggression and frustration. Two years later, just knowing how many caregivers a child endured before being placed showed no differences in terms of um, the way their parents talked about them. So I think it's leaning us away from just knowing the sheer number of caregivers and rather knowing more about the attachment context into which the children are going. Another question that comes up is age. Uh, these are all old children, older children to be placed. Four through eight is, is old as compared to the vast majority of parents wanting to adopt want um, much younger children. So we put that question to this data. If a child was older at placement, um, looking at the whole sample, mothers do talk with more disappointment. They talk about the child being less happy and less affectionate. 
if the mother was insecure and the child was older, she's showing more anger, less warmth, and the child is thought to be less affection, affectionate. If the mother, however, was secure on her adult attachment interview, the child's age of placement was unrelated to the way that she talked about uh, those children. I call this finding a policy finding. It's also a King Solomon's decision. What do we do here? Do we give the, the children who are older and perhaps a little bit harder to parent, to the parents who are securely attached on their AI because we know that they can manage them? Um, I'm not so sure we wanna go quite down that, but this is at least some evidence to help us understand how to make these placements. The other thing we did was this story STEM assessment profile, and it's a way of accessing the child's um, internal world. And what we do is we take some doll figures, here we have some animal figures, and we tell the beginning and the middle of the story. And then we ask the child to show me and tell me what happens next. This story is a story about a family of pigs, and we set them out on the table, and we say that um, the camels live here, the cows live over here, the pig family lives over here. One day, this little pig goes for a walk, goes all the way over here. Uh-oh, the pig is lost. Show me and tell me what happens next. And we're looking here for the child to let us in a little bit on their inner world. How do they resolve conflicts, um, such as an attachment conflict like this? The other set of the stories come from the MacArthur Battery um, and uh, show stories like a family sitting around a dinner table. Um, Uh-oh, um, Paula's gone and spilt the juice. Show me and tell me what happens next. So all of them in involve a conflict and we um, allow the child in their own words to show us and tell us. So sometimes a lot of these children don't necessarily have the language to um, let us know how they're thinking and feeling but can and play uh, the bread and butter of um, most social work and child psychology work to play it out, to show us what's going on. So we collected all of these um, stories. We did it over three times. That was when they were first placed, one year later and two years later. And they cluster around these uh, uh, discrete clusters. Secure responses. Uh, the little pig drops little bits of bread and follow, finds a way to get back to their mother. Or the mother tells the child off for spilling the juice, but then cleans it up and pours the juice again. Or intense aggression, where a big fire interrupts or a parent gets um, put in jail and killed because um, they, didn't, uh, kill, they didn't help the little pig find their way home or didn't help with the juice. The juice. Disorganized themes or avoidant themes. So the next slide, uh, th these are um, a better description of what goes into all of our clusters, which you can look at later as we display the slides. We're gonna move along here to look at how did it turn out looking at the story stems um, across our whole sample over, three, over the two years of placement. So in the end, it was three years. So the good news is that across all of the children, despite whatever adult attachment interview their parents uh, provided before they were placed, you see that the green bars go up. So all of the children are showing more themes of security and secure attachment themes across time. That's the good news. The not so good news is you will notice the orange bars, the purple bars, and the um, blue bars. Those indicating aggression, disorganization, and avoidance flatline. They don't seem to budge. And so we learn here a really important uh, theme that it's much easier for children to adopt and internalize positive themes, security, than it is to get rid of the negative themes. But if we look at the um, adult attachment interviews and how um, those play out in terms of what happens to the child's internal world when you place them with at least one parent who's securely attached on the adult attachment interview. So here we have neither secure. Those are the highest bars. Neither mother nor father was secure. And we see the highest rates of aggression in the story stems and the highest rates of disorganized um, themes. And then if the mother was secure or the father, or the best is if both, but just having one secure parent those themes are much lower. There's a statistically significant difference 
And so there's something that goes on by having a parent who's securely attached that helps metabolize and do something to those negative representations, which you can imagine has a huge impact on the child's functioning. So we call this somewhere the training in the art of hypervigilance. Why is it that these late adopted children are so influenced by their adoptive parent state of mind? Some of these uh, analyses, I was even, I thought, well, there's no point in doing them that, you know, a child who's been in such uh, adverse experiences for four years, six years, eight years, how could we see that just being placed with a more benign and hopefully positive caregiving context would influence their um, internal world? So we, Miriam, we have a bunch of questions already like running over the chat. So it is oh, now, okay. you have about 13 I, minutes I, I, left. I the three minutes to, um, okay. We're near the end. Okay. We're, near, um, we're just going to do a little bit of theory here in terms of why is it that there's such a quick response. Um, Mary Main says that at times of distress, the secure infant has only one consideration in mind, how to alert the parent for proximity. The insecure infant, in contrast, has to also consider the parent's response. So uh, again, we're just highlighting a little bit about the process by which the child placed with a securely attached parent has a way of actually um, just expressing their distress, which we think is a, is a way of, um, should I stop now? I can take the questions now. I might have to do stop share so I can see you. Um, yeah. Okay. How do we wanna do this with these questions, uh, Paula? Wow. I'm sorry, Christina. I was on mute. Are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We yep. can. This is, yes. Hello, Christina Filipakos. How are you doing? Good. Thank LGRA. you so much, Miriam. That was a great lecture. Um, we already have a couple of questions, some really good questions for you in the chat. Um, so the first one is, to what extent can an adult with a non-secure attachment transition to secure attachment? How could a clinician support that process? So that's the million or billion dollar question. So I think we now have quite a few interventions that try and promote a reflective capacity. We have um, uh, a book that came out uh, last year, two years ago, um, which is a handbook of attachment based interventions. And in there, especially within the parent infant psychotherapy field, um, there are many different um, ways in to try and help a parent stand back, reflect a bit on their own behavior, and see the child as somebody independent with thoughts, feelings um, of their own. So I don't know I have in quite enough time, but there's, um, I think every single intervention in some ways is trying to um, provoke a parent to be more reflective, to be curious about their own experiences, their own state of mind, and especially to think about the thoughts um, and feelings of their baby, and this can be done with very young babies, as a way of moving forward. Awesome. Thank you for that. So the next question goes on to expand on the first one a little bit. Also, how to support children from parents with non-secure attachment. Is there a methodology that can be applied, say in schools, to identify children with insecure attachment and provide early intervention? So this... Um, the schools are an interesting one. We um, were affiliated with a program here um, in New York that was um, the brainchild of someone called Rebecca Shamanshana, who uh, sadly passed away just a few weeks ago. Um, but she had something called Re Relationships for Growth and Learning, which was very unique in terms of it being a peer um, therapy that was delivered in Head Start programs, so in the schools. So that just opened up um, for children who wouldn't otherwise have parents who could take them for treatment to develop it um, in the schools. And the other big name in this field is somebody called Robert Pianta, um, who worked with Mary Ainsworth, who has a whole school-based, attachment-based um, intervention. And I can pass along some of, some of those papers. I think, um, yes, in our attachment-based intervention book, there's all kinds of examples of um, working with children. We, um, and I spoke in Jerusalem about something we have called the group attachment-based intervention doesn't go very well with coronavirus um, to offer a group um, intervention with all of us um, isolated, although they, we are managing. 
which is really very much trying to target social isolation um, and working with mothers and babies together, including a component that has a clinician working directly with the, the child zero to three as a way of um, providing with, for them some experience of what it's like to be with an adult who's paying attention, who's present, who's following their lead, um, for example. But I can, I, can, I can make available some of these um, references. Awesome, thank you. A child that is 12 years old, now in foster care, obviously has some kind of attachment disorder, but is too old to be diagnosed with RAD. His behaviors are very similar to those of a younger child that would have RAD. At an age of 12, what other attachment disorders should be looked at? So I think um, we have a difficulty with the way that the DSM has been um, talking about attachment and that all we have are these extremes which really um, describe best children who've been in institutions or have been at the severely maltreated, but not the gamut. And I think the reason for that is that almost every psychopathology is an attachment disorder at, at some level. And so um, we haven't quite delineated very well um, those specificities. I think, you know, having an understanding about the um, research that comes from attachment theory is a good way in to uh, have your clinical work um, reflect some of our theoretical and research findings. So um, I think, you know, building that therapeutic alliance with a 12 year old, having them um, gain some trust uh, in, in you as somebody who is trying to understand them and giving them a place to actually um, reflect upon their childhood history, everything that's happened um, before. Uh, is they often work very, very hard. I'm often so impressed with these kids who, who know that their lives depend upon getting the help to sort out what happened to them and where they are now. Um, so I, I think having you know, clinical work that's infused with an attachment perspective is probably the best way to reach a 12 year old like that. Thank you. I have one participant asking, can you provide the name or ISBN for the book you're referencing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is it backwards for you? It looks like it's no, backwards. it's good. Okay, but I can make it available. So what's interesting about the book is that the vast majority of the interventions are in the zero to three, but there's a few that um, span beyond that. Um, one of them that is very compelling is something called Connect. Uh, somebody called Marlene Moretti um, does that work with parents only of adolescents. There are some of us who might not have believed that just working with the parents is a good way to, do, uh, to work with adolescents, but it's um, global. It's gone around the world. And, um, she's got a chapter in there that, that people can read about. Awesome. I think that's all the questions we have so far. We still have a couple of minutes if anybody has any more. Oh, here, one just popped up. Are there models for older children and families that hold space for parents' complex trauma while they support their child's trauma? What is the next best model when they are too old for CPP? Um, so those are excellent questions. I think the, the other place to go is uh, the mentalization-based treatments. And there's a whole um, gamut of those that um, are, are there for children from latency, so middle childhood, all the way up through um, adolescence. Um, and they're based somewhere on reflective functioning. Uh, Peter Fonagy took the reflective functioning finding from our study and built the mentalization-based treatments from that. And then people have been, um, so somebody called Nick Midgley, I think is one of the, the best people to read on some of those. Um, the other, the other place that I've done some work with is a place in Illinois, uh, it's in Chattuck, it's called uh, Chattuck um, Center. They are a residential treatment center for children with attachment disorders from eight to 18. Um, one of the innovations there is that they do the adult attachment interview at intake with the parent, and then I code it, I rate it, and then we meet on a big Zoom call with the clinicians and we go through the responses as a way of guiding the therapeutic work. And their model is trying to somewhere get those parents and get those children who come from very, very seriously um, adverse experiences. These are often failed international adoptions, failed um, domestic adoptions. They're kind of the last port of call. Um, 
and they have many innovations in terms of trying to work with the with the families including they have an intense um, intake uh, that is um, not for every parent but that they use where they actually move into the home for um, I think it's a week and they can observe how the family is in a more kind of ecologically valid way and it kind of kickstarts the whole treatment and then the child enters in so there's some pockets um, that's for the extremes and I think the mentalization based treatments um, where they're available for the children um, from uh, five through adolescence. Awesome thank you there's a follow-up to that what about for a child in foster care but doing reunification they were once doing CPP the child's age is three but now in foster care and plan is to reunify what is something that would suffice so I have heard of other cases where maybe bringing um, the, the, the parent that the child is with now and the parent where they might go and bridging those. And if the two are amicable enough and willing in the um, best interest of the child to extend the CPP circle to include um, both or at least um, have, you know, one dyad and then the other dyad. So CPP, I think, you know, can stretch. Um, we can find ways of working with, you know, even, you know, those older children, not that what that child is three, but so finding some way of um, having the child gain a sense of this is how grown-ups play. This is how grown-ups um, are with me, whether it be the foster mother or um, the biological mother um, or the mother that the, the child is going to. But I think any kind of, context where you have a clinician who's very busy keeping in mind all of the stakeholders is, is very helpful. 